Okay, I'd like to introduce uh, Linda Highgate from uh, NQ Dry Tropics, who's going to give us a bit of a rundown on the Burdekin River catch and tenders and so forth, water quality focus that we've been running, which has been lots of fun by the sound. <laughs> yeah. Sure has. So, um, well, thank you everyone for inviting me to come today, and I'm very lost without a pointer, so we'll see how we go. Anyway, so. What um, I was just going to talk about some my experiences. I've been in the Burdekin for three and a half years now, and in this region, looking at rolling out incentive schemes to farmers and graziers to do stuff to improve effectively water quality. So, for those of you who don't come from Queensland and don't really know about the wonderful Burdekin, it's basically it's 130. Our region includes. Sorry, I'll just go back. Our region includes the rivers, which is the Burdekin, the Don, the Horton, the Ross, the Black, and the Douglas rivers. Sorry. Sorry, it's not the Doug, sorry. I don't know what that's in there for. It's um, approximately 133,000 square kilometres. And for just so that you know what we're dealing with, that's 55% the size of, of Victoria, and it's about the same size of England. That map there, that top, what you can see is sort of that light coloured in the northeast, the north sort of west corner. These are electoral boundaries. That's actually the... Um, seat of Kennedy, so it's Bob Catter's seat. Um, and what we've also got, what I wanted to just point out to you, it goes quite a, raw, quite a way north, that pointy bit up the top on the coast, that's Palm Island, that's the Palm Island group. Hinchinbrook Island's just over to the east of that. And so that top part of that Burdekin um, caught the cyclone, sort of the very destructive winds out of Cyclone Yazi earlier this year. So it's a sort of... And, and the other thing is, the red lines that you might be able to see, they're not actually rivers, they're the only sealed roads that we have through the region. So, um, and it takes about, for me in Townsville, which is in where the pink is, which is the seat of Herbert, which was really fun being in that last election because it's one of the most marginal seats in the country. So we were getting everything. They were going to promise us a lot. Um, and that was quite interesting, going from a safe seat. So to get from... Townsville down to Alpha, so this road here, that actually goes into Rockhampton, so it's a long, long, long reach Rockhampton road. To get down to Alpha here, you've got to go down this road, down a dirt road to here, and it takes about nine hours from Townsville. So that's the sort of scale that we're talking about and tr what we're trying to deliver in. Um, our population base is around 200,000 people, and most of those live in Townsville, Air, Home Hill, Bowen. And Alf, Charters Towers and Alpha, so there's not a lot of people out on the rangelands. And it's predominantly run, 94% of the land use is rangeland grazing with a very significant intensive agriculture industry and a horticultural industry on the coast. And during the drought, most of your fresh tomatoes would have come from Bowen, which is our region. We get them, Bowen's two hours south of Townsville, we actually get them delivered in Townsville via Brisbane, but that's fruit and vegetable marketing. So there you go. That's sort of just a bit of an outline about what we're dealing with um, in our region. Uh, so the other thing, this was a photo, um, I come from Victoria originally. This was actually in the age when the Fitzroy was flooding. Um, and that shows, you can see the plume, the Burdekin River plume. Our, our Burdekin River rangelands discharge around 7.4 million tonnes of sediment per year. The big dust storms that upset Sydney and Brisbane, and they actually even made it up to Townsville too, was about four and a half million tonnes of sediment. We're losing that off our rangelands. And pretty much all of that's going into a World Heritage listed area that we call the Great Barrier Reef. Now, this is another slide that shows our plume and our dam a bit more effectively, um, and also shows the lagoon, the Great Barrier Reef. This is the Burdekin Falls Dam here, and then the all that dirt goes out into the reef lagoon and it has an impact on coral regrowth and stuff like that. So a lot of people think it's pretty important to do stuff to improve the quality of water leaving that river system. So basically I arrived at, up there um, from Victoria um, uh, in about three and a half years ago and it was at the end of the National NHT2 program and at that stage, the, the organisation was a provider, it was a purchaser of services. And so under the NHT2 program, they had funded different groups around the region to deliver extension and incentive programs. And essentially, each group got a chunk of money. They rolled out an incentive program, delivered some extension around it. And generally, um, and there was a few, and I'm going to talk a little bit about one in particular, but generally speaking, um, 
They called for expressions of interest. Um, the, the groups may or may not have helped with the people write applications forms. And if projects were assessed based on a metric decided on by the group, or I'm going to start talking about black boxes. And, and so I thought this was a great opportunity to sort of think through, you know, how, how we could use this information, because there were about eight or nine different ways of doing this stuff within our region. And what we could learn from that to build some principles and policies in what we did. So I'm going to talk about, um, and it's been, this has received a lot of press, the Lower Burdekin Water Quality Tender. So we've got this sugar industry at the end of the Burdekin, Burdekin system. Um, it's basically the Lower Burdekin Water Quality Tender was a joint project between our organisation, Central Queensland University and probably someone else. And effectively it was designed to reduce nitrogen pesticides and sediments entering the reef lagoon. And what was interesting, I guess, there was a few novel things in this one, and was that landholders were able to bid for any activity. So they could, so one of our issues up there at, at the time was um, over-application of nitrogenous fertilisers, so people putting on too much nitrogen on their sugar crops. So they could actually bid to reduce nitrogen and get paid for it. So it was anything they wanted, they could bid for. And then there was this... An, I have to be quite frank, it was a super duper metric. Don't ever ask me to please try and explain it. I couldn't even do that. Um, and it was developed to impact the costs, you know, the, to develop, to calculate the impact of the activity on the pollution reduction per dollar cost to the taxpayer. And one of the interesting things about this, and I think it was really important to us in terms of how we move forward, was it actually took quite a significant amount of time and at least was a day's work to collect the data required to complete the metric for every farmer. Now, I've already told you about the scale with which we're trying to deal with, and, try, and we're dealing, we're running most of that work out of Townsville. So, you know, it's not, it's just not trivial to collect sort of necessarily all the information. So this is, um, this was the all the stuff that went into, and I call it stuff because I don't understand all this science. But you know, that was all the things that went into calculate the nitrogen reduction. Um, there was a similar thing for pesticides, and there was another thing for sediment. And you know the reality, and then they're trying to compare sediment, nutrient, uh, nutrient, nitrogen, pesticides, and sediments against each other, and no one really understood it. And so that had anyway. We'll go. I'll go into that. So basically, out of that water quality tender, we had 105 expressions of interest received. So that could have you could have been a grazier or horticulturalist, didn't matter what industry you're in, or a sugar producer. We had 155 EOIs. From that, we had 88 submissions, and people were requesting, they requested about $2.2 million, and the total value of all the projects was 4.3. So they were willing to consider to contribute about $2 million of their own money. Out of all of that, when they sat down and took all the data, and again, it took a lot of time to A, collect the data, B, put it in the matrix, and then, then rank all the projects, which also those delays have some impacts as well. We got 37 successful applicants and the projects funded, there was only about $600,000 there. The landholders contributed $891,000 and, you know, and from the matrix they could work out that we could reduce sediment of, you know, reduce sediment by 500 tonnes at $90 a tonne. Nitrogen and pesticides, they all reduced and we could work out how much it cost us to do it from this super duper matrix. And I just, because we at an economist conference and because I had to do it, I had to show you this graph here that people put together and of the red dots basically the red dots represent the successful bids the blue dots represent those that were unsuccessful and what I think what was really important when you know sort of taking all this information and putting it together it's not a lot of difference between something there and something down there so you know the clearly there's some really high value environmental you know it, uh, sorry so clearly there's some projects there with high environmental benefits, but once you're down at the bottom, you're actually not getting that huge amount of different impact. So we, so we sort of came, like we came in at the end of 2008. And we did an evaluation of all these incentive programs from just giving it straight out grants to these sort of complicated things. And one of the things that we found, and there was another program, and some of you might have heard about it, called Landscape Linkages that was rolled out in our region as well. One of the things that we found was that transparency was important. People didn't understand a black box. And the other part about it was that the extension staff or the people out on the ground that were trying to talk to the farmers that you wanted to encourage them to get in, they didn't understand it either. And once you go into this system where people don't really know 
what's going on and whether that, you know, the likelihood of their bid being successful, it has impacts. And I guess I'm going to talk a lot more about social stuff as well than just economics. And what we found in those early days was that effectively failure in one round had an impact on subsequent um, involvement in, in other attempts in incentive schemes. And that is a legacy that we're still confronted with today, three years down the track. So I guess in 2009, I didn't really, I don't want to really talk about the whole reef rescue program, I just want to talk about what we're doing in our region. So just after we'd done that, the reef rescue program started or commenced. It's um, in our region, it's operating across sugar, horticulture and rangelands and more recently the grain sector. Over the last three years, um, we've engaged about, with about 280 businesses um, to complete around 500 projects and I'm going to tell you guys, we don't have people in our region but boy do we have hectares and there's a lot of hectares in those people's businesses. And, and with a total value of about $10 million. So, and I guess we're sort of at a point now, we're halfway through this program, and we're starting to ask these questions about what, you know, how do we do this? So what works and what doesn't work? So how do we refine the program as we move forward? And what does this actually mean in terms of practice change? I mean, I'm not going to talk about end of catchment targets. The, you know, we've got this highly variable rainfall. There's all sorts of issues of impacting on that. I'm going to talk about what does this mean in terms of practice change? And, at the moment, we um, have just finished, we're just doing an evaluation. Um, yeah, we're just doing an evaluation and I'm going to present some very preliminary results here. I would have thought we would have had a little bit more, but it's sort of, we're about six weeks off getting the final report. So just as a bit of background in rolling out this program, we had 12 months work, but we only had six months to do it. And that's an issue with funding cycles. We get these things called wet seasons and where we may or may not get on to, you know, get out of the office for three to, like this year it was eight months of the year. Um, and in the first year we had a big wet season, so it was pretty wet in February. I couldn't even get down to air, which was on the Bruce Highway. That's Highway National, you know, National Highway number one, and I can't go down there because it's flooded. Um, and we got quite significant oversubscription in sugar and horticulture. Um, and we were building on past efforts. We didn't have the time to roll out an MBI, pro you know, like have the super duper metric. We couldn't go out and collect all that information. And our evaluation had also identified that people wanted help and they wanted simplicity. And we wanted to commit them to longer term outcomes. So, you know, we were sort of asking them, our application is just, what are you doing now? What do you want to change? And what are you going to do differently? So the question when they ask, what are you going to do differently? That's actually what goes in their contract when they get one over a five year period about they're going to commit themselves to doing these things differently. And that was supported a lot by the extension staff, like they're the ones out there promoting this program and that was really a, an important thing for them too. They wanted to know what was going on so that they could help people. We also had um, a water quality improvement plan. Um, this is a map of the Burdekin and Horton River catchments and each one of these, and we split the region up into five basins, um, and 52 subcatchments, and the bars there, this is primarily based on modelling but supported by monitoring data, the bars, the size of the bars represents the amount, the total amount of sediment being lost from that basin, and the colour of the subcatchments represents the rate at which soil erosion is being lost. So if it's a dark colour within that basin, where these subcatchments are losing 800, more than 800 kilograms of soil per year. And the other confounding factor is that we've got this great big dam in the middle. So you can see, can you see the blue bit in the middle? That's the dam. And depending on who you speak to, and again, we're in uncertain science and there's a lot of experts on this stuff in where I live, um, that dam traps about 60% of the dirt that leaves those rangelands. So we get into this basin down here and our mod our mod monitoring indicates that we're actually underestimating the soil loss from that basin. We're starting to see quite a, if you take those, the other bars down to 60%, we're actually seeing quite a lot of dirt going from that, the Bowen Broken Bogey Basin. So I guess I'm going to sort of put it to you that, and so then what we decided to do, we've got this massive great big area, we're not going to roll out incentives across the whole region, so let's prioritise where we're going to do it. And I guess is that, you know, if you're prioritising in terms of spatially, so we're only rolling these out across 20% of the region, is there actually any need for more prioritisation? Um, in years two and three, and I just want to just, oh, this is a bit of an aside, but I just would like to let you know this, 
it was all an Australian government program. We're rolling it out as a regional NRM group. And um, the good old state gov Queensland state government, and I know this, I've got some colleagues here, announced that they were going to regulate farmers and graziers in the three catchments adjoining the reef at the same time. So we got different instruments operating. So these farmers, uh, 2009, I think it was 2009 or 2010, was the was the start of the um, reef protection package, which was which was regulating farmers and graziers in terms of what they could do, and then requirement to do environmental risk rate plan. So, you know, that has an in, and that's called the reef protection package. We're rolling out reef rescue. It's all reef. No one really understands the difference. So this just sort of, just, just another little twist in this interesting story. So in years two and three, um, you know, we're getting to a point where, you know, that what we're getting in terms of the applications that are coming into us are about the amount of money that we've got available. Um, applications are all assessed to make sure that they're suitable and eligible and that they will meet water quality guidelines. And I guess I'm, I'm really starting to ask the questions, what's the role for very complicated matrices to get, you know, these lowest, ten, lowest value costs? Because they've got a really high cost for us. They're not only high in collecting the data, they're high administratively, they're high in terms of people not necessarily coming back if they miss out. So I, I really am wanting to stress this. It's all very nice to sit in Canberra or in a university and design all this stuff. But when you're actually on the ground, you've just it, there's different so sorts of things that are, I believe are actually coming out. So I guess coming, so that was how we did it, what we did. What and I guess my question is always, what do we, what does this all mean? What's actually happening on the ground? What's to, what's going on differently? And at the moment, we're doing an evaluation on everyone that was successful in round one and two. So the people that were most recently successful might not have had a chance to implement any changes. So what are the people that got funding in two or, th two or three years ago, what are they doing differently on their farm or their property? We're interested in hearing about people that applied and then haven't actually, you know, that we haven't heard from again, so they're unsuccessful, they're gone out of our system, what's going on there? We're interested in hearing from people that are not we haven't heard from at all. And the last two, the unsuccessfuls and the not heard from, um, we're really only looking at the sugar industry for that. And I'm going to present some very preliminary results here. And one of the questions that we're interested in is what's the path that people take? And it is a complicated path, I acknowledge, but can we get a path that people take? So what are parts of the program in terms of our communication and engagement can we use to help improvement or are more or less important than others? And this slide, and um, I make no apologies for complexity because I've got to do something complex. We asked the question to the farmers and graziers was in relation to the change that you made on your farm, please rate the influence that each of the following had on your decision to change at that time. And this one here is, you know, our, our thing was, well, we want to put money into extension. If we train people, you know, that's going to make them change. So this one here is going to workshops, field days, seminars or farmer meetings. Now, interestingly, for, sugar and for our sugar and horticultural producers, uh, sorry, our grazing and horticultural uh, sugar producers, it was about the same, you know, out of, and it was on a scale of 1 to 10. They thought it was OK. It was pretty good. That was how they were finding out information. This one here is our horticultural producers. They can brand their products. They're actually quite competitive. They don't necessarily talk to each other. Um, we had people saying that fact sheets were a waste of time. Well, across all industries, they were equally important. Interestingly, the actions and opinions of other landholders were probably not as important as what we considered. Certainly, um, we always think that that's the way you're going to get changes through farmers talking to farmers. You know, it's all equivalent. Um, and again, lower in the horticultural ind industry, which is reflective of the competitive nature between individuals. And one-on-one -on -one extension staff by uh, ourselves or, you know, one of our delivery partners. And is the last one over here. And again, that's reflective. We've as we've rolled this out in the sugar industry, we've had less one-on-one -on -one engagement with the producers, um, but we've worked a lot more intensively with the graziers. Now, the reality, and it's probably no surprise to anyone, but the, the fact that in the last one, which is the highest one, which is pretty constant, consistent across the board, was the fact that incentives were available at no ex you know, to subsidise the cost was why they got involved in the program. So they're getting involved through a multitude, you know, like the multi-pronged approach, I guess, that we're using, what that's telling us is we're probably going to keep it, like we can't ditch stuff, which is a bit of a problem, but, you know, it's just the way the world is. But the fact that incentives are there is really one of the key things to motivate the change. Um, 
we're asking them what their you know what did they actually what changes are being made on their farm, and um, and I'm pretty excited to the preliminary results I've seen that the changes that they're saying they're made are reflective of what they're in their applications, so that's always a good sign, and that um, in horticulture and sugar, so in grazing, people are um, installing fencing and watering points so that they can implement rotational grazing systems. For us, it's spelling paddocks during the wet season primarily. And you know it is. It's not quite cell grazing. Um, it's erosion con control, and they're putting in. Uh, sorry, the installation of piping means they're putting in, putting in watering points to even out grazing pressure within a paddock. For horticulture and sugar, um, again, people are nominating changes being made to the irrigation system. And I forgot to mention that our sugar production system is actually irrigated sugar. It's on a flood irrigation system. Um, uh, fertiliser application mes methods and movements towards zero tillage. So they're the things that people are nominating, which is sort of, it's good because it's reflective of what they said they would do. Um, now, the interesting thing was, and we, this data was presented at a workshop in Townsville last week. We've spoken to the, 50, the people, we spoke to 20, and this is only preliminary too. Um, so we talked to 25 people all up, I don't know how many this is related to, of people that applied but didn't actually get the funding. And 50% of them actually made the change anyway. And we need to unpack that more and, further, and you know, try and identify what was going on. Um, and, but there is, you know, that's a very important point. And in terms of the whole Queensland Australian government, government's reef plan program and trying to identify what's happening in the reef regions because of all the activity that's going on there, we're trying to pick up what's happening outside of Reef Rescue and some of the other programs. And these are the sorts of things that we need to know about what's going on. Um, the interesting thing is that the people that were unsuccessful in sort of our program were actually, there was a high relationship with their failure or lack of success in the previous MBI program that I spoke about as well. So, and what we're finding is that that's the reason that they're not coming back is that they're a bit over the whole writing grant applications and not getting a you know, not getting a positive response. So, which is again why we're sort of, you know, one of the things we're looking at is spending more time one-on-one -on -one with those sugar producers to help them get the application so that they can get them through. But, so when I go back to the beginning where we had this black box and people were writing submissions, what we're finding is that one or two rejections is leading to less, is more reluctance to engage in our program. So it, it's something that we need to consider, I think, in terms of the complexity about how we do things. Um, and we've spoke, uh, we have spoken to, the, um, to people that haven't been involved and we sent out 100 letters and I got 10 phone calls from 87-year-old sugar growers telling me that they're no longer farming and that they're not going to change and all of that. That was really interesting and insightful. I haven't got the rest of the people, the, the details from the people that, surveyed, um, that were surveyed. Um, I, ba I guess basically um, I, I would argue that our experience and history is that we've had a long history of incentives programs and I call them incentives, we call them market-based incentives, whatever you want to call them, but it's giving money to people in different ways to get environmental outcomes. And continual evaluation and improvement, there's a lot of other things that we do. We do like debriefs and lots of different evaluation type activities. Um, has really moved us away from complex methods or mechanisms. and. You know, and the reality is I believe that they have a very high administrative cost that, or transaction cost or whatever you want to call it that's not entirely factored into um, some of these you know, UBU stuff. And I, I'd, I'd argue that we've got evidence now that they don't always endear us to our target audience. And that's some of, um, it's one of my key points, I guess. Um, and it's almost moved us back towards a tender-based system and you know, we're looking at people's budgets like a, you know, a grazier will put in a, a budget for like $700 a kilometre to, to a fence and another one will put in for $3,000 a kilometre to do a fence and I go through all of these and look at it all, it does my head in and you know, it's almost moving us towards saying just give them all $2,000 and that'll be, you know, that again reduces the administration and the complexity. And from what we can tell um, at the moment, I think incentives are helping to accelerate on ground change within the region. And even on Friday, I was with a group of sugar producers in air and I was presenting this sort of stuff and I started asking them and I said, what's happening? You know, what can you tell me what's happening in the region? And, and the comments that came through was um, that people are seeing someone do something differently and they're not even, because we've been rolling these, the sugar program out on a year, like a 
have an annual call and then you close the thing and then you wait till next year. So people are seeing their neighbour doing something, they're seeing it's really good and that they're actually not even waiting till the, they can't be bothered waiting to put the application in in the next round, they're actually doing it anyway. And I mean that's all anecdotal, I don't know, you know how true is it and it's one story but you know that's the sort of stuff and the feedback and the information that we're getting is that um, while there's a lot of money going into the region and that all that money's matched by about one dollar thirty for every dollar that we're giving we're go that's going out through us or through you know us as our taxpayers we're getting a dollar thirty of the farmers money's going into it as well it's something like that you know it, it is actually getting the the impact is going beyond just the program and the people that were the 280 businesses that were funded um, so I think that was pretty much all I had to say so it's not much it is three years of my work but of my life but anyway so thank you